Okay, welcome everyone. Let's get started. Uh, today, it's our great pleasure to have Chong Yan here. Uh, she's a PhD student at University of Washington, uh, working on database and software engineering problems. Um, she, um, her recent work actually has also won a um, ICSC Distinguished Paper Award. Uh, and she's no stranger to MSR uh, since she has interned here twice before. Uh, so it's great to, to have her back here and talk, talk, talk about her thesis work. Hi, uh, thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, I'm Tong Yan from University of Washington, and today it's my great pleasure to talk about my thesis work, Understanding and Improving Database-Backed Applications. So a uh, web application is one uh, of, of the representative of this kind of application. So from social network, uh, collaboration, entertainment, and e-commerce, we interact with web applications on a daily basis. A, typic a typical architecture of such application includes three tiers. So first, you have a frontier, which is usually a laptop or a mobile device. And then you have an application server, and also you store the data uh, persistently in a backend database. So the, when, a web, uh, when an application runs, uh, let's take a short, uh, shopping application as an example. Uh, by typing the URL, you send an, the client signed an HTTP request to the application server. Uh, the server will run some code, imperative code like Java, uh, Python, or Ruby. And inside the code, there are something like this that issues a query to the database. Uh, the database uh, will reach will, uh, so an example queries like this, which selects the top rated products. So the database will return the query result to the application server, and then the server uh, will organize the data into a web page in the form of HTML and send it on the client to be rendered on the front end. So needless to say, the uh, performance of this website are very critical because a very slow web page will drive customers away and make the company lose money. So, but actually, how does the real world application perform? So we profile 12 open source applications built with Ruby on Rails. Um, a lot of them are very popular with, uh, with, some, with over 2,000 stars, and including famous ones like GitLab and OpenStreetMap. So we profile these applications. In the profiling, uh, we generate synthetic data according to the data distribution of the running website. So in the profiling, uh, we measure the time to render a web page. And here, this figure shows the web page loading time distribution across more than 100 pages from this website. Uh, from, uh, from this website. So uh, uh, from this application, so this x-axis shows the, uh, the time number in the second to load a web page, and then y-axis shows the percentage of web page that takes shorter than the corresponding time. So the normal expectation is that um, half of the user expect a page to, less than, uh, to load less than two seconds. But in the real world, 20% of the pages from these applications take much longer, even with a very small amount of data around one gigabyte. So a lot of the web pages are, are really slow. Some of them take even more than 20 seconds to load. So there are a lot of research to uh, try to make, make it faster. And then these optimizations happen at each layer. For example, on the database side, there is query optimization, and people use uh, physical design tools like auto.mean to accelerate queries. And for transactional applications, there are all kinds of concurrency control protocols to uh, make transactions faster. And on the application side, there are many ways, like compiler technique, to um, make the application code runs faster, for example, code that code elimination, vectorization, and the people often use uh, do object caching with tools like Redis. And on the front end, there are also many ways to accelerate a web page. For example, you do like a web caching or do web assembly, or you can accelerate your web page using uh, 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 accelerate JavaScript using JIT. So all of this app, uh, all of these optimizations are application ignorant, which means that you don't need to understand the application in order to carry, uh, in order to implement these optimizations. But what if we can, or what if we do have the understanding of the application? Uh, can we do better? 
that brings the key insight of my work, is to leverage the application semantic uh, in order to optimize this application. So each optimization still happens at one layer each time, but they use the application knowledge in order to do the optimization. So let's see a few examples. So at least uh, for, um, the, uh, for example, on the database side, instead of looking at a single query, uh, I look into how the query result is used in the application uh, in order to do the query optimization. Or on the, on the application layer, so instead of like a general purpose compiler technique, I look specifically into how the application interact with the database. For example, instead of looking at a single query in the, uh, in the, in the application, I look into how the queries are connected in the application. And on the client side, so instead of looking at a single uh, HTML file or JavaScript file, I look into the whole data retrieval process behind every uh, web page data in order to, and I use the whole process to drive the front end, front end application. So on each layer, uh, I build a system to do this uh, application that use the, uh, to do the optimization that use the application semantic. Uh, yeah, so this brings the outline of my work. Uh, so first, uh, also I want to mention like this work has been published in both the database conference like the ODB or software engineer conference like ICSC. Uh, so to give an outline of the talk, so first I'll introduce um, uh, each system in detail and then I'll mention some of my other projects. And then after that, I'll dis uh, discuss my ongo uh, some of the ongoing and the future work and then conclude. Okay, let's start with, uh, uh, with the, the systems. And I'll start with Cruel that optimizes the, co um, the co application code. So Cruel is a compiler that determines the best order, uh, best query order for transactional applications. But before I start, so why would the order of the query matters? Uh, so, uh, so to give a background, so many applications like the shopping application uh, use transactions to ensure data consistency when a lot of customers are buying the same item. So one mechanism to uh, do that is, while, uh, is do, by doing the locking. So basically you lock a tuple when you first access it and then release the lock after you finish. So one of the mechanisms is called two-phase locking. So in this case, let's assume, let, let's use a case where two customers, Alice and Bob, are uh, buying an iPhone at the same time. So you have two transactions to represent this process. So when transaction one starts, and then transaction one uh, reads the iPhone tuple, and it grabs a log on that tuple. And meanwhile, transaction two also starts. It also tries to um, grab the log on the iPhone tuple, but it cannot do that because the tuple, uh, but because the a uh, log is held by uh, is held by transaction one. So transaction two needs to wait, and now transaction one proceeds and updates the tuple, and then transaction one selects the Alice tuple, which is the customer tuple, and then updates the balance. Uh, meanwhile, transaction two still needs to wait because the log is, this log is held by transaction one, and then transaction one finishes the transaction and releases all the logs. And now transaction two can finally proceed, uh, grab the lock on iPhone, and then uh, update on the, uh, on the customer, which is Bob. So in this case, uh, under two-phase locking, the, these two transactions are actually serial, running in a serialized way, uh, so which is bad because they almost start at the same time. But what, uh, what if we change the order of the queries? Can we do better? So if we, if for transaction one, we read on Alice tuple first, instead of the, uh, instead of the iPhone. And now transaction two can also proceed because uh, it's, it's, uh, it's reading another, uh, another customer, Bob. Uh, so it's not conflicting with transaction one. And at the same time, these two transactions can, uh, can run in parallel. And now transaction one selects, an iPhone, uh, selects the iPhone tuple and the transaction two needs to wait and transaction one finishes, and then transaction two proceeds. So after you change the order of the queries, um, the tra two transactions are actually like running, uh, running in, more, in a more parallel way, and then the, locking uh, the lock waiting time is significantly reduced. 
So when there are more parallel transactions in the system, this game is more significant. So if you have like four transactions that start almost at the same time, so with the original query order, they are kind of like sequentialized, but then like when you change the order of the query, they can almost run in parallel. So here we have seen that um, the order of the query really matters to these transactions. But how can you change the order of the queries while, or while not uh, changing the application behavior? So that's why we build Curl, a compiler to do the query reordering. So Curl takes the C++ code with embedded SQL, uh, SQL queries that, uh, that implements a transaction as input. And Curl will analyze the control and the data flow uh, of the application code. And meanwhile, it will take the application workload and the profile in order to understand uh, which query is likely to be contentious. And gathering the analysis and the profiling information, uh, Curl reorders the queries while preserving the transaction sem uh, the application semantic. And then Curl will output C++ code uh, with reordered embedded queries. So let's see each component in detail. So in the first stage, profiling, uh, the goal is to quantify the contention level. Uh, so in order to do that, uh, we calculate the standard deviation of the query running time. So the idea behind this is larger the deviation, which means that a query sometimes is likely to wait for the log for a long time. So the larger the deviation, more likely um, the, uh, the query is to touch a contentious data. So the second stage, analyze the uh, control and the data flow of the application code. The goal of this is to do the data dependency analysis. So essentially, there are two types of dependencies here. The first is the data dependency among the program variables. For example, here, if the, um, the query on line one selects the, uh, do a select query and store the result in variable one, which is used later in the second query. So the order of these two queries cannot be changed. So there are another type of data dependencies that that involves the database constraint. For example, uh, the query on line one selects on table one, which is updated later by the query on line three. So the order of these two queries cannot be changed. So after you get the data dependency and know which query is contentious, now we can formalize the reorder problem. So in the for uh, we formulate it into an integer linear problem. So the constraint of this problem is that uh, the data dependency constraint cannot be violated. And the goal of this formalization is to make the contentious query appear as late as possible in a transaction. Yeah, so thus, uh, solving, the, uh, solving the integer linear problem will give us the final order of the, all the queries. Uh, and then like Quora will uh, do the um, transaction rewriting according to uh, the query order. Let's see the evaluation. Um, so we evaluate uh, the curl and then the. Uh, mm -hmm. when it, are you just, the IOP problem, is that just within a single program or across all of them? Uh, it's just within one transaction. So I only change the order of queries within one transaction. And are it, there so many dependencies that you need to go to the trouble of turning this into a. Uh, ILP. It, the, I mean, it's a pretty, yeah. you know, it's a the, pretty big hammer for these relatively short programs. So, actually, like for TPCC, yes, exactly. But I, the first, like, I do some other, like, a uh, benchmark, which like TPCE. So one TPCE transaction can include more than twenty queries, so which make it more complicated. And an interesting I found because, like, I interned at Alibaba, so that like their transactions actually. Although when you run the transaction, only four queries are issued, but there are more than 30 queries defined in the application. So which means that the reordering is not an easy problem if you want to handle all the cases. Yeah. Okay, see so the evaluation. Uh, so we show that um, the for the we compare the we order the transaction with the um, uh, with the original implementation of the TP, uh, TPCC workload. And uh, we, uh, yeah, we, we run these two, both versions of transaction in one system and compare the performance. So um, we also try to increase the contention by increase the number of threads. So when there are more threads, there are more contention in the, uh, in the database. 
so we can see here that after we do, we do, uh, we do the reorder and with curl, uh, the, perf the throughput is significantly increased uh, with um, a speed up of, of up to 3.5 times. And meanwhile, uh, we are also able to reduce the transaction latency up to 70%. We also compare uh, this reordered um, transaction with other concurrency control schemes, including OCC and MVCC. Uh, so similarly, like under very high contention, uh, we can see that the performance is, um, the throughput is much better than the other concurrency control schemes, especially under high contention. To conclude this project, uh, in this project, we observed that the order of the queries has big impact on the transaction performance. So we built Coral, a compiler that leverages information about query contention and, and, and automatically do the query ordering in one transaction, in, in each transaction. And Coral generated code improved the throughput up to 3.5 times and outperformed other concurrency control schemes under high contention. And I also want to mention that reordering is implemented in the critical transactions of, um, of Taobao in Alibaba when I was intern there. Does, mm -hmm. you can, this is an embarrassing question to ask but, um, for me, but is, does the TPCC benchmark require running exactly the code that, that it supplies or is it just the logic? I mean, do you, would it, um, if, I, if, I, if I use the reordered operations that you define, would I still be compliant with the benchmark definition? Uh, I, I didn't. To my understanding, like the uh, like the specific conditions only says what you need to finish in the transaction. I didn't remember seeing that you have to exactly follow the query order. Maybe there is. Maybe I missed it. Um, but here, to my, like to my understanding, and also like my experience with Alibaba, people only care about what you want to achieve within this transaction. They do not really care that much about like which happens first and which happens next. That really matters. Uh, that matters if you have, for example, uh, exceptions, and then sometimes you fail. So you have to be careful with that part of logic. But then, uh, if you handle that part correctly, people really don't care much about which query happens yeah. first. Okay. Thanks. Okay, any other questions with this project? Okay. Uh, so then I'll move to the database side. Um, so, uh, yeah, so on the database side, uh, I, the project is called Chestnut. It did, uh, it's customized the data layout for an application. So in order to, before I introduce this project, so I'll, uh, I'll introduce the problem what I ob uh, that I observe uh, when profiling this um, open source applications. So what I observe is like there's a data representation mismatch. Let's see an example. So here, for example, this is like a Slack page. And in order to run, uh, render this Slack page, you have three data models. For example, uh, first you have the channel to describe like the, uh, all the channels in the, in the page. And then you have activities. An activity can be like, for example, sending a message or sending a file. And then for each activity, you have, a, uh, you have a user associated with each activity. So in order to render this page on the application, the data is represented in the nested format. So to begin with, you have a top level a ch a channel object. And then inside each channel, you have a, a list of activities, for example, sending a message or a file. And then inside each activity, you have like a user. So in order to render this web page, the, applica uh, the application server will first uh, store the data in this format and then in order to render this page. But these three classes map to three tables on the database side. So the channel table, the activity table, and then the user table. So uh, one thing I observed that is like it's usually very fast. For example, if you have 10,000 activities, it's usually very fast to retrieve all the data from the database. But it's very slow that to convert this um, tabular data into this deeply nested data format. So and usually because of the data representation mismatch, uh, the translation between these different representations is usually the bottleneck of the application. <coughs> And even worse, there are different, uh, different application queries will use a different layout. So previously we have seen that for this Slack web page, we use this kind of like layout which store uh, activity within channel and then user reading activity. 
if we have another web page, for example, this is a web Slack web page that shows the user statistics. So for this web page, we actually need the data to be stored in this way, where the uh, activities and the channels are stored within each user in order to get, uh, so for example, how many channels the user participate um, for each for every user. So different application application queries will require different data layout. So how to run these queries faster? When this is like a chatting application. So one example is uh, instead of running all the queries and getting all the data directly from the database, we can build a caching layer that do, uh, that's, it's an in-memory cache that stores the data in this nested format. And then the, the read queries can go through the cache in order to avoid the expensive translation between these two. But the problem is that we already seen like different queries require different way to lay out the data. So deciding the layout for a single application is hard enough. Also, if you have different applications, the data may be like laid out in a very different way. So it's very hard to de uh, um, so um, it's very hard to figure out that for each application. So one way to do this, is one solution, is to hire an expert to design this layout for each application. But experts are expensive. So we built Chestnut. So Chestnut takes the application code, and especially the application queries, and generate a customized layout for each application. So with the Chestnut generated data uh, layout, so Chestnut will generate a layout for this in-memory cache. And with this cache, um, all the read queries will go through this, uh, this in-memory cache and answered by this customized data layout while the write queries will both update the in-memory cache and also it will propagate to the backend database to update the persistent data as well. Okay, so then the question is, there are two key challenges in designing Chestnut. So the first is how to decide the data layout given there are many queries in the application and each of them require a different way. And then the second is how to answer the query using this customized layout. So the first, how, uh, let's see how Chestnut works. The first step is to do the layout enumeration. Oh. Mm -hmm. Clarification. This, the, so this, this cache that you're referring to, where does that cache reside? Is it inside the database engine? Mm -hmm. So it can be either on the database side or the application side. So in our evaluation, we kind of like host the database and application on the same machine. So uh, it, it doesn't matter that much. So uh, I would imagine that is, this is more like on the application layer, but it can reside on both sides. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so to in, for the first step is to enumerate the data layout uh, for each query. So imagine like a query to, uh, like taking a query to render this Slack web page as an example. So first we can lay out the data as exactly what, how the data is stored in the database, which is this chapter format. Or we can lay out the data with only one level of nesting, you only store the user uh, nested within the, um, within the activities. Or you can lay out the data in a very deeply nested way, and we also enumerate all different kinds of layout. And upon each layout, we also enumerate uh, the we, well, um, the chestnut. We also enumerate the index. For example, you can create an index on the channel name, or you can create a partial index. For example, uh, you create an index on on activity, but only indexing on the message activity, but not the file activity. And also, because the data is nested, so the key. Of the uh, of the index, that's not necessarily to be uh, the the object that you are indexing here. Uh, so here, like we can create an index on the activity, but the key being the activity user's name. So we then put the username here. And also, uh, we can create um, a partial index with a complicated predicate. For example, here we can create. Uh, create an index on the channels, but only indexing on channels that exist a message activity. So here this channel does not only contains file activity but not message activity, so it is not being indexed. So we'll enumerate many kind, different kinds of indexes upon, uh, on the top of the different layout. And the second step, after we, for example, after we decide like to use this layout, uh, how, do we how do we generate a query plan? So here, assume this is the expected query result. So how do we go from here to here? 
apparently we cannot, uh, we can no longer use the relational query plan because we are working on a completely different layout rather than a, rather than a tabular layout. So in order to do, uh, in order to generate a query plan, uh, we also enumerate the query plan just like we enumerate the layout. So when we do the plan enumeration, uh, we start with a small size plan like this. For example, here, um, this is the query plan that only has one level of for loop that works uh, that selects on the uh, on the channel array. So for each query plan, we enumerate. Uh, we use symbolic verification, which is the, like a bounded testing, um, to verify whether this query plan produced the expected query result. And apparently, this query does not, so we do not consider this query plan. And we keep increasing the query plan size. For example, we increase the query plan size to have like a nested for loop. And in, in this case, it still does not produce the expected result. And we keep doing that until we find a correct query plan. So in this, in the plan enumeration, we start from small size plan and increase the, increase the plan size. And for each plan, we do the verification to see whether it produced the expected query result. And this is how we find a query plan for, uh, for each data layout. And then after we have handled the read queries, so how do we handle the update query? So here, imagine here we have a write query that updates this content message from hey to hi. And in order to do that, we, for each update query on each data structure, we generate a read query to identify the objects to be updated. For example, for this, um, for this query, uh, for this uh, write query on this data structure, we first to find out the top level channel that contains a message that with content hey. So we find, we, we'll generate a query to first to find the top level objects. And then inside this channel, we find, uh, we have a nasty query to find the corresponding uh, message, uh, to find the corresponding message that is included within the top level channel. So by doing, by issuing this read query, we find exactly the object to be updated, and then we update it correspondingly. So for this query, uh, Chestnut will just search the data layout and then generate query plan exactly as the other read queries in the application. Mm -hmm. So uh, it seems like uh, from step one to step three, you're sort of uh, doing something like uh, creating views and also yeah. Analysis uh, and creating power plan and also uh, mm -hmm. documenting the views and analysis. So it seems this seems to be our replication of what database has already been doing. So will that be possible to leverage the database to do this kind of stuff? The difference, yes. So, so some like it's very similar to like finding like a materialized view for the. But then the key challenge is here like I'm storing the data in a different layout. So that's a key problem I want to solve because I don't want to store the data in a tabular way. Because the, app, the application requires the, this nested data layout in order to render the web page. So like, like I said before, the, the, the key uh, bottleneck is you translate from the tabular layout to this nested layout. So I'm kind of trying to create all like the materialized view process for the nested data layout, which we are able to um, yeah, decide uh, how do you store the data in a nested way and do the, answer the query using that. Mm -hmm. When you in in your in your data layouts, mm -hmm. could you end up creating duplicate information because you're denormalizing in a hierarchical way data that was normalized in the underlying database? Yes. So that's what I'm going to talk next. How to handle this problem? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. So then, like the, previously, I have we have seen that how to hand, how to generate uh, enumerate layout and generate query plan for each query, and we'll do that for all the queries in the application. And uh, if you have infinite memory, then you don't need to care about this duplication, and then like each query can choose the best layout itself. But if you and also like, but in this case, like update is also slow. But if you have limited memory and you want to, uh, like, uh, you uh, you want to you, you don't uh, you want the right query to be also fast, then you have to like different query uh, different layout for queries will have to share some of the data structures. And then like if you like the user will give a memory bound, so all the layout has to stay within the memory bound. So still we convert this into uh, still into an integer linear programming problem. So the constraint 
is that for like for each query plan, uh, for each query, I'll at least choose one plan, and then one plan of uh, corresponding to one layout. So the, all the use the data structures for all the queries is within the user provided memory bound, and then the optimization goal is to minimize, uh, minimize the total estimated query time. And then still, we use an external IOP solver uh, to solve this challenge, to solve this problem. And then the output of IOP will tell us exactly which data structure to use and which query plan to use. And then, mm -hmm. how do you estimate for each plan? What's the uh, plan? Uh, so we kind of like because the query plan is in the form, like for example, like uh, in the in, oh, sorry, I just skipped it, in the for loop. So we kind of like just do like. Um, estimates the cost of like, for example, for loop, how many tuples you iterate, and then nested for loop, how many tuples you enumerate. Yeah, so basically it's kind of like a rough estimation of the query plan in the form of for loop. Mm -hmm. Much of a problem would it be to do something like uh, optimize the, you know, the average uh, query response time rather mm -hmm. than the, the uh, runtime. So if you're optimizing response time rather than throughput. Oh, sorry, so you mean like uh, optimize the response time? Yeah. Um, so that's like the query time is the response, oh, you mean the web page response time? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so because here like um, we get so the the chestnut will actually do like an analysis uh, analysis of like you just giving the pages and then the page, uh, the code to generate the pages and then uh, like we kind of build an interface that the user can assign weight to each web page, and then the weight will translate into the weight of the query, and then like use that to solve and try to um, try to minimize the estimated query time. You kind of like uh, uh, minimize the total time of all the web pages. Yeah. So uh, in this formulation, we can also assign weight to the queries, which is weight, the weight is related to the weight in the, of the web page. So, yeah. And yeah, so using the output, we, and then after we take the output, uh, the chestnut will generate the C++ code for both the data structure and also the query plans. Okay, let's see the evaluation. Uh, so we evaluate on four open source popular web applications built with Ruby on Rails, and this includes a chatting application, project management, forward, and web scraping applications. So all of them have a lot of stores on GitHub, and they are very popular. And we compare with the application implementation with three relational databases, which includes um, MySQL and PostSQL, post, uh, post uh, PostgreSQL, which are role store databases. And we uh, set the buffer pool size to be large enough to make sure all the data can be held in memory. And it also compare with a commercial in-memory column store. So uh, in this, this figure shows the average query time with the same amount of memory. Uh, so here we uh, use the relative time to MySQL because MySQL is often the default database chosen by all these applications. And uh, we, this is like a figure shows the average query time. So for each, uh, for each application, we take the top 10, uh, top 10 visited page web pages. And then for in average, we get 26 queries per application. And these queries include both the read and write queries. So, um, here, uh, this shows the, uh, the normalized query time. So as we can see that um, Chestnut is able to accelerate the application query by up to 9.8x. And then it makes the query run faster for all the applications. Okay, now it comes to, we also, uh, we also measure how long it takes for the Chestnut to uh, generate the data layout. So for three applications, it takes through a rather fast, so it can be done by less than 10 minutes, except for one application. Uh, so this is because like when the query is really complicated, it takes a while to uh, find the correct query plan. Um, okay. So in this project, uh, in Chestnut, we all first observed that the object-oriented database applications uh, process data in a nested format, which is different from the data layout used in the database. So the data, different data representation usually cause the bottleneck for the query processing. So we propose Chestnut, a data layout designer that customizes the data layout and the query execution for each application. 
And it uses an enumeration based algorithm and they use an IOP solver to search for the best laid data layout given an application and the evaluation shows that for real world applications, it can speed up the application queries by up to 9.8 times. Mm -hmm. Were there any applications were not able to speed up? Um, so in our evaluation, we haven't found any, but there are some queries that we are not able to speed up. So this is usually because if you set the memory bound, sometimes you make some queries faster, but the other queries slow. So it might happen. So because I'm just too trying to uh, increase the overall query time. So yeah, so I would imagine like a future use of this uh, chestnut is to, for example, for some really slow queries and you want to build a caching layer, so you can use that uh, to build a caching layer instead of you manually write object caching uh, by yourself, which is the common practice in current applications. Yeah. Okay, so now let's move to the front end. So in the front end, we uh, build Panorama, which that's a view-driven optimization. But before I introduce Panorama, uh, let's, uh, I'll first introduce some of the interesting findings we see for the, open, uh, for the um, real world web applications. So we did a comprehensive study of 12 open source Ruby on Rails applications. And by, in this study, we, check, uh, we check, uh, sampled 140 performance issues from their bug tracking system. And we also do the uh, pro, and we also find 64 performance issues from profiling of the most recent version of these applications, and adding them uh, like adding them all together, we summarize them into nine anti patterns. So the anti pattern is some like the way that the uh, developer writes code, which makes the application slow. So some of the anti patterns are like, um, for example, there are different APIs that are doing the same thing, but then like one API is faster and then the other is slower. Uh, so, and also sometimes you, so the application says like select, select start from, but actually there's only one field that is used later in the application. So you can actually replace the query to be select uh, field one from. So these are some examples of these anti-patterns and then we summarize nine anti-patterns. So we manually fix 64 issues across 40 pages from these 12 applications. And here this figure shows the average speed up of each anti-pattern fix. So here, these are nine anti-patterns, so each bar represents one anti-pattern fix. And uh, so for all of them, like most of them, they, have, they can achieve more than two times speed up. So previously we see like this is by manually fixing and then we are trying to build tools to do the automatic fix. That's why we build PowerStation. So PowerStation can fix six of the anti-patterns. So it does static analysis on the source code and then do, you write rules to do the pattern matching to find these anti-patterns. So all of the fixes of PowerStation is semantic preserving, which means that you can just fix without changing the application behavior and all the fixes can be transparent to the developer. But what about the sys3? So this three actually some of them give a lot of performance gain, but those changes are not semantic preserving. So basically in this any patterns, you basically, you need to change your web page design in order to trade off for the performance and they are not semantic preserving. So that's why we built Panorama to help the developer make this design performance trade off. Okay, let's see some examples of this trade off. So, uh, yeah, for example, this is like a blogging web page. This is a, like a mock-up page. But here, like imagine you have like a long list of blogs to render and then it takes really long time. So what can you can do, uh, if you, you can divide this long block list into different pages to make it faster. What if it's still not enough? We may see, okay, this the number of comments. I only show that for some of the blog, no, not all of them. And maybe it takes a really t long time to compute. So I don't render them at all and make it way faster. Or what else you can do? So for example here, uh, like you have the number of visitors, maybe people will not need to see that immediately when you render the web page, you can render that later. And by doing that, you can reduce the time to like, for, for example, 0.5 seconds, which is good enough. So all of these changes, uh, all of these changes can greatly accelerate the web page, but then they need to uh, change the design of the uh, of the web page so and making this design performance trade-off is not trivial for example uh, first you have to change the code across all the layers in order to paginate this block list for example uh, you need to find the 
uh, finds the variable that re uh, stores the block list in the HTML file. And then you have to go through multiple files to find the code that issues the query, and then go to the query log to find out how slow that query runs. And furthermore, understanding the trade-off is also hard. So when you just start building an application, you have no idea like how this web page will render, how long this web page will render when the data scales. If you have a small data, it should be fine. If you have a large database with some kind of data distribution, it's also okay, but only if you have a large database and some certain data distribution, it is very slow. So understanding the web page itself is um, hard enough, and not to mention you want to understand, for example, a particular component um, in this web page. So here's some like, interesting statistics. We calculate the issue solving time of, of, of this, of this of a few applications, and we find, find that in average, a uh, issue takes 29 days to solve. But when the issue is related to doing the design performance trade-off, it takes much longer, over 140 days to solve. Which means that like solving this kind of problem like, might be like harder than solving other issues. Okay, so how can Panorama help? The first, Panorama tries to help the user to understand the web page performance. It does that by rendering a heat map. So a heat map like higher cost shows, a redder color shows a higher cost and a greener color shows the lower cost. So you may think, have seen uh, this heat map before, for example, Chrome Profiler also has like a heat map, but the difference is that in the Chrome Profiler, it only shows the cost of the JavaScript alone. But here, for the heat map, we show the whole data uh, processing, uh, data retrieval uh, cost under each web page element. So how does Panorama render a heat map? So for each web page element, uh, we first find the variable that, uh, stored, uh, that stores the data for that web page element. And we do like data, uh, data and the control flow analysis and trace all the way back to the query that issues the data for that web page element. And then, this, uh, and then we ask the query optimizer to give a cost of an uh, estimation of the query cost. And then we propagate this cost all the way back to the variable and then use that as uh, the cost to render the heat map for each web page element. So with this heat map, and then the user can easily understand uh, like how, how, how well my uh, web page will perform considering all the Back, uh, all the back end data retrieval cost. Also, uh, after the user see the cost, and then it can start change the web page design to improve the performance. So Panorama will suggest the design change. For example, if you right click some of the uh, web page component, and then it will prop out what kind of page, uh, web page design you can do to this component. And then if the user ch uh, choose the component, uh, cho uh, choose the design change, the panorama will do the code refactor automatically. So it will change the code on the front end, the application, and also the query as well. So then after panorama does the code change, it, it will render another heat map, which shows that after you do the design change, how well your web page performs now. And the user can go back and forth of this process to make the best uh, design performance trade-off. Okay, uh, I don't have time to show a demo, but I'm briefly show some uh, figures of the panel, uh, snapshot of Panorama. So Panorama is uh, integrated into RubyMine. So RubyMine is a very popular IDE uh, for Ruby on Rails developers. And you can choose to start Panorama, and then the Panorama will render a heat map on your screen for your application. And for each component, you can right click to choose the design change. So Panorama will automatically do the change, and it will show you the code before and after. And you can say whether I want to accept the change or not. Okay, let's see an evaluation. So of course, the first thing to evaluate is to see like how fast the page renders after you make the design change. So we measure the end-to-end -end speed up of uh, 14 web pages across four applications. And here is the time distribution of, uh, of these web pages. So here, uh, like this is the original time. So some of the web pages take really long, like around 20 seconds. But after you make the web page design suggested by Panorama, and then you can accelerate the page up to 17 times faster. 
Um, so, but this is not the only evaluation we need to do because imagine like you have, you remove all the content from the web page, then it renders extremely fast, but who wants like an empty web page? Um, so we also need to evaluate how the user is satisfied with the new design. So we did a user survey on the web page preference. So we present two web pages to the user and then ask them which, which design you like better. And here's the result for four different kinds of web page design changes. For some of them, uh, the user prefers the original design like here, like here and here. But surprisingly for some of them, the user actually preferred the new design, for example, asynchronous loading or we remove some of the tiny content from the web page. So this may be because like after you do the change, uh, your web page looks cleaner and the user likes it better. So here in average, 22% of the user prefers the original and then 20% 20, 20 prefer the new design and the rest of them prefer the designs equally. So this shows that uh, by doing some of the design change, you significantly increase the web page performance, but with only like a very slight trade-off on the user satisfaction. Okay, uh, I also want to mention this, like this line of work, both the study and also this uh, view, the view design performance trade-off uh, is covered by many press. So it's like reported by UK Chicago News and also morning paper. So morning paper is some, uh, is some, uh, is a summarize of some interesting papers and they show them to the developers. And our paper is also featured on Ruby Weekly and also Hacker News, which we received more than 400 points and over 300 comments. So people are like actively discussing it. And we are also contacted by some, some consultancy space uh, company that tries to help the Rails developers speed up their application. Yeah. Okay, to summarize Panorama, the first, uh, we see that the change in the web page design to speed, uh, to speed up a web page is a common practice, yet making the design performance trade-off is not trivial. So we built Panorama, a tool that suggests the non-semantic preserving changes. And it provides an interface for the developers to understand the web page performance uh, by using a heat map and also uh, the, the, the developer can do the trade-off by only interact with the web page and the panorama will do the code refactoring for you. And the panorama can speed up a web page up to 17% with a slight sacrifice in the user satisfaction, uh, proving that the trade-off is worthwhile. Okay, uh, any questions on this project? Mm -hmm. Can you comment a bit on what's the space of design options you present to the developers and how did you come up with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so here, like, it's, we only, uh, so in the paper, we only present four type of design changes. The first is like doing approximation. So it's kind of like similar to the uh, approximate queries in the database. You, instead of saying exact number, you have like a rough number. And also we can do asynchronous loading, which means that you load the main part of the web page first and the some part later. And we can do paginate, like pagin uh, divide a long list into different pages and also remove some of the small content. So how, how does Panorama decide which, which page change to suggest? It depends on the web page element. So for example, if the element is a long list, then I can suggest pagination. Or if the, uh, like, this is like a very small part on the web page, then I can suggest to remove that or do asynchronous loading. Or if this is like, a, a, for example, a statistic number, for example, how many visitors I have, and then Panorama will suggest doing approximate. So it's based on like, it will detect what type of element that is, and then make suggestions doing with the pattern matching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> when you show the heat map, mm -hmm. you only show the performance of the database operations, right? Yes. If the page also contains some non-database operations, which that's, is also very expensive. Yes, that's like a future do. work. So it is hard to do. So usually if that, um, we are working on that. So basically in this heat map, if usually, uh, if Usually if just like propagates the query result, then it's easy. So if you have like a for loop to go through every tuple in the query, it's also okay. But then we, if you have like very complicated pattern, then we do not handle that for now. So because like it's kind of like hard to, for example, you have like a f some code to, uh, to 
process part of the data and some other code to process the other and you don't know the split, then it's very hard to do the estimation, so we don't do that for now. So currently, it's more like, it's most likely the, data, the, the query overhead behind each web page element. But maybe the page contains something that has nothing to the data, right? It's uh, then just it's a computation loop, maybe it's downloading something else from a remote server. If, um, if the database operations are not on the critical path, even if you optimize all those things, yeah, it can uh, enter still performance will change. Right? Yes, yeah, so sometimes the most the slower part can be like external things, for example, render, like retrieve a picture from the remote website. Right. Uh, yeah, this part we do not handle for now. So this is a challenge because, for, for example, if you have like external servers, then you do not have a good estimation of how long it takes. Yeah, so here we this only focus on like slow queries that contributes to some data on the web page. Yeah, but we, we are in the process of adding, for example, the code that process the query result into the estimation as well. Okay, uh, here. Okay, now I'm going to introduce, briefly introduce some of my other projects that I did uh, when I was an intern in MSR. So this is in a little bit different direction. It's about building a more intelligent data preparation system. Uh, so the key idea behind these two projects is to leverage the open source code to help the data scientists with their work. So we build a first system called Autotype that does the auto automatic validation of semantic data types, uh, for example, zip code, credit card, uh, using the open source code. So the idea is like people may have already write some open uh, code to do the validation on the GitHub, and then we can automatically search and use them. For, uh, for future tasks. And then we are, able to, uh, the, we are able to find functions for 84 data types across all different domains with a very high precision. And also we are, uh, this uh, last year we are building a project called, uh, called Autosuggest, which learns from the open source code um, from uh, Jupyter Notebooks and uh, recommend data operations based on the data with the model built with this open source, um, code, uh, open source notebooks. And then this recommendation includes the operator parameters, for example, which column to, join, uh, to do the join or pivot, and also the operator types. And we, can, uh, we are able to achieve much higher precision, so at least 60% higher than the existing commercial vendors, which also try to do this kind of operator recommendation. Okay, now I'm going to introduce some of the future, ongoing and the future work. So one line of ongoing future work is, so previously I have talked about um, how we can improve the database uh, functionality. And then now we are also explore, oh, sorry, performance. And then now we are exploring how to improve the application functionality to make it better. So one direction is to maintain the data, help the application maintain the data integrity. So we look into specifically into data constraint. So there are, cons there are a lot of the constraints specified among persistent data. For example, you set the password length, the maximum password length, or among a lot of options in one table, there's only one default option. Or when you buy something online and want to return, the application wants to ensure that the return and the purchase, they have the same order ID. So there are all kinds of different constraints among persistent data. And they are defined in different level, in different layers. So the constraint can be defined in HTML code, and it can be defined in the Ruby, uh, Ruby or application code, and also in SQL as uh, in SQL as well. So the constraints are very common. So 74% of the data fields are involved in some kind of constraint, with an average 1.5 constraint per field. So these constraints are very prevalent. So in this year's XC paper, we have a, we show a study of the constraint-related issues. So we find there are many problems with this constraint. Uh, for example, um, there are many constraints that the application wants to have, uh, only defined in the application code, but not on the database, which means that the data administrator can change the data in order to violate them. And also because these constraints are defined in many different levels, sometimes times we find many conflicting constraints. And also, there are many constraints that defines incorrectly that make it very easy to violate. For example, if you have a constraint on two tables, you only validate on, when updating one table but not the other. So in, because you are defining it incorrectly, this, this constraint can be violated easily. And now we are building a tool to uh, analyze the constraint in different levels altogether and, try, and to fix the data constraint issues. 
And to go uh, to talk about like more of the future work, the one direction is I want to discover, uh, I want to find more chances to leverage the application semantic to optimize the application. For example, we can also use the data constraint that defined in the application to do the query optimization. So sometimes with the constraint, we can revise the query to a more efficient, equivalent but efficient way using the data constraint. And also we can use the uh, for example, there are many statistics cl uh, collected on the client side, for example, click rate, and for example, how often people submit some forms. And we can use those statistics to help uh, with the query optimization, in particular, uh, cardinality estimation. And another broader direction, uh, I want to build a smarter middleware that can incorporate all the static and dynamic an, um, analysis, of, uh, the static or dynamic cross-stack optimizations. And this middleware can provide an uh, analysis interface to um, support adding more kinds of optimizations. Uh, okay, to give a summary, so in this talk, I introduced how to leverage application semantics to optimize each layer. So I talk about Guru, a compiler to reorder the queries for transactional applications. And I talk about Chestnut, a tool to customize the, uh, design a customized data layout and the query plan for each application. And also Panorama, a tool to help the developer make the design, web page design and performance trade off. And also I introduced some of other projects in the line of building more intelligent data preparation system. And I introduced some of the ongoing and future work, which includes help the application maintain data integrity and find more chances to leverage the application semantic and building a more smarter middleware. So that's the end of my talk and I'm happy to take questions. So, in, in that um, optimizing the layout of the, of the uh, object model, you started with um, uh, enumerating different ways to uh, mm -hmm. uh, to to um, to write the query mm -hmm. and check whether that's equivalent to um, users. Um, uh, um, I, I'm not very familiar with um, Ruby's model, but is it possible that you can start with uh, that query in Ruby? Mm -hmm. and um, find a equivalent translation. And from that, we can kind of enumerate, like uh, changing the order of the for loop uh, to, to see if we can find them. Uh, uh, yeah, for the query plan, we actually have an intermediate presentation of the of the query plan. It's just like you have logical query plan in the database. So we don't uh, like do arbitrary for loop. So we have like an intermediate to re representation to say what kind of for loop to iterate each array. And we verify on that instead of like a very general purpose program. <laughs> So this like intermediate representation can like easily maps to like an actual code, but it's something in the middle between the actual implementation and the high level Ruby object. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You didn't say anything about stored procedures. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you've got program logic spread mm -hmm. out. Yeah. Some of it's in the stored procedure, some of it's in the application that calls the stored procedure. How does that affect the kind of work that you're doing? So I think store procedure is very similar to a program. So in some sense, I think it's like a simplified way because the program can do many more things than a store procedure. So actually there are many, uh, there are many work out there that tries to do like a, like a coherent analysis across different languages. But those, uh, those like framework usually targets um, different language, for example, Python, Java, and Ruby, I think it's not hard to add the proced uh, store procedure into part of analysis. So I, the idea is like you build like a control and a data flow analysis of, of graph, and then, but you can compile different languages and then have a, like a uniform way to represent the graph and then do the analysis all together. So I think this is possible to extend to store procedure. People have done that for different languages, but, uh, not as far as they, uh, not including procedures as far as I know, but I, I can imagine it's not hard. Would you have to re, I mean, is it simply a matter of reordering the operations? You're going to have to generate new code for the. 
for the procedures. I mean, you're abstracting. This is like verified lifting or something. You're abstracting mm -hmm. the programs into some intermediate representation. Yes. But when you start moving things around, you may not be able to just reuse the code that oh, okay. you abstracted. You may have to actually generate new code. Yes, so and then maybe also have to distribute it between these different layers. I mean, it's yeah, so complicated. that's like, I think it's more like a challenge for the software engineer. I think the challenge here is more like when you generate the output, how do you like make sure that the developer is satisfied? So that's kind of like one challenge I faced when I was doing the intern. So because like I want to do the source to source code change. It's not it's not cross language, but it's still hard enough because you want to generate something that can easily accept it by the developers. I imagine it might be harder if you do it across different language and place which part of the function into which language. So I think in that case, the, it, you have to design a tool that can take some hint from the developers to say, uh, for example, which part I really wanted it into, to stay in which layer. So I think that part is challenging. Mm -hmm. So, excuse me, the first part of your of the conversation we're having dealt with Curo mm -hmm. that did analysis of C++ programs. Yes. And it must have done some pretty advanced flow analysis to determine the dependencies between the queries, correct? Uh, <coughs> so that's... I would say that's kind of like a standard uh, compiler analysis with the with the query considered. So for the the control and the data dependency analysis can already figure out what the data dependency between each variables, and of course we do not handle any if the like if the function some code has side effect for example. Uh, that that would be harder, but. Usually, if you don't have that, and then like the data analysis can just be done with standard compiler analysis. Did you do cross method, cross. Uh, yes. What technology did you use for that? Uh, it's just like I combine. If you have like multiple programs, I just crash them into one big graph. So like you have like for example, for if you have like a data analysis. Uh, data and the control flow for another function. And this function is called by like this function. I just merge the graph together and I do the analysis. But what commercial C++ compiler do you use? Oh, LLVM, Clon, Clon, Clon and oh, LLVM. Right. Yeah, Clon, yes. So they, they have like a very uh, convenient way to manipulate the graph. So I already compiled that into a graph. I see. Thank yeah. you. Yes, the reason I like Ceylon is that they can actually generate very beautiful source code from the intermediate representation. So I find it very hard to have a similar tool in Java because all the Java tools I also because I also try to build this tool in Alibaba and they all use Java. And for Java, it's really hard to find a tool that generates beautiful, easy to understand source code from the intermediate representation. Mm -hmm. So uh, in the chestnut work, mm -hmm. So you made this observation that typically there is a mismatch between mm -hmm. the table representation and the how application consumes it, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess all your evaluation was based on Ruby applications? Yes. So my question is this observation, is it specific to Ruby or because in Ruby the mm -hmm. developers have this mindset that we even don't need a database. We do all mm -hmm. the database operations yeah. in the application, right? Yes. So they use the database as just a simple key value store in most cases. And most of the advanced database things, like even transactions and so on, mm -hmm. they try to implement in the application. Mm -hmm. So my question is this observation that you made, is mm -hmm. this a side effect of that developer's mentality that we do everything in, in the application? Mm -hmm. or, or you also saw that in other applications? Um, there are two aspects. The first is that of Ruby is slow in somewhere. So basically, like, um, okay, I'll start with the, the other. So first, like what you said, like the design goal of Ruby is really want to make everything in the, in the application, but that's not the truth with all the open source applications. So if you, uh, because I, like, I see a lot of, I profile a lot of open source, and they actually run very complicated queries uh, they, because they realize Ruby is inefficient. So they want to push this down to the database. So they have very complicated join queries to handle, like to merge multiple things together instead of, instead of doing it in Ruby. So they do have very complicated join queries. And then the second aspect, 
there are some there are something to blame to the Ruby because usually like the Ruby translation is quite slow. So Ruby in, inside Ruby, they use the Ruby code to translate the tabular data into the nested data, and that part is slow. So uh, in the experiment, I have kind of like a different different queries. So there are some queries that if I replace the Ruby translation with, for example, protobuf, it can accelerate the query by like up to two or three times. But then that's not enough to cover all the cases. So even if you use the protobuf, there's still like a mismatch between the data representation. And it's still hard to translate, for example, five-way join into five-way display nasty data. So there's still like uh, four or five times performance gain you can get by designing this data layout. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's one more question.